Hello and welcome to part 3 of Let's Learn Blender. In this video, we're going to dive into adding materials onto 3D objects in Blender using Blender's default render engine, Eevee. You can see on the screen right now, I have a fairly simple looking scene with five or six or actually seven different materials on different objects, including actually the environment in my scene. So this is what we're going to be creating in this video. Zooming in and taking a closer look, we're going from left to right. We have a flat or matte, simple colored material that does not have any glossiness at all on our green cube. Next up, we have a glossy red cylinder. Next up, we have a metal sphere that's reflected the scene around it. Next up, we have a glowing yellow donut. It's actually called a torus mesh object. And finally, we have a purple glass monkey head that's actually transmitting light through the glass object, which is kind of neat. Below all those objects is a floor. It's a flat square plane, but it actually has an image texture on it. We're going to get into using nodes in Blender in Blender Shader Editor. If you've never seen nodes, this will be an introduction to you in this video, including adding image textures, including image textures that are procedurally made in Blender that you can create those images right inside of Blender. Last but not least, we're going to talk about some scene lighting using an environment texture called an HDRI image. That's what this picture is around our scene that has, you know, clouds and a sun that's projecting light. It's called an HDRI. We'll get into that in the last part of this video. If you're new to my channel, my name is Colin. Hello, I've been teaching Blender here on YouTube since 2011. If you're interested in seeing any of my latest Blender tutorials, I'll put a link to this playlist called Let's Learn Blender on the screen right now. So check that playlist out for more videos like this. I also teach how to use the Godot game engine, which is another free and open source, just like Blender, a piece of software, but the Godot game engine is used, of course, to create video games. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into using Blender. First up, I'm gonna go ahead and set up my simple 3D scene with the 3D objects. I'm gonna assume that you know how to use the transform tools, how to add 3D primitive mesh objects into your scene under the add menu, which of course you can get to with the shift A, keyboard shortcut right there. And I'm going to assume that you know how to get to different views, like your front view, your side and top views using keyboard shortcuts or this little gizmo up here. Of course, if you click on one of these little circles, the orbs, the green one goes to the front view, the red ones go to the side views left and right. And of course the blue uh, orbs go to the top and bottom. So I'm going to speed up this part of the video. I'm going to add my five objects and my floor. I'll start off actually by deleting this default cube because the default cube in your scene in Blender has a material already on it. And I want to start from scratch. So I'll press the letter X key on my keyboard or the delete key, to delete that cube. And I'll speed up this part of the video. I should probably mention that if you're new to Blender, you might not be aware that you can adjust the properties of a 3D primitive mesh as soon as you add it into your scene using this little pop-up down here. The last thing you did, if you moved an object, well, you'll get a little last operation popover right here and you can open it up and you can change the properties of what you just did, including in this case, the number of major segments. I'll change it back to the default 48. Minor segments go around. Around. So this changes the number of faces or polygons on the object. I'll click and type in 24 there and press enter. Note that as soon as you add a 3D primitive mesh into your scene, you can change these properties. But as soon as, I'll go ahead and change the minor radius to finalize that uh, donut shape. As soon as you change the object's transformation, like where it is, you just moved it. Well, this popover becomes the move last operation and you can't change your primitive mesh without doing some 3D modeling, which is beyond the scope of this video. So there you go. I'll go ahead and finish off this scene. All right, so as you can see, I have my simple scene. I've got my five objects and my floor. Let's go ahead and add some materials. I'll go ahead and zoom in on my first object, the cube. To add a material onto a mesh in Blender, you have to select the mesh. That means it has an orange outline. You go over to the properties editor. This is the editor that has the properties of the scene as a whole, your file, and the object that you have selected. So if I have the cube selected, you'll see that I have a little beach ball tab here. It's called the materials tab. And right now you can see with the mesh selected, 
there are no materials. There's not much here. If I have some sort of other object selected like a light, well, that beach ball tab is no longer there because you can't put a material like you would onto a mesh onto a light. So you have to make sure you have the right object selected. If I go ahead and press the new button under the materials tab, you can see I have now added a material called material.001 onto this object, and it comes with a lot of properties. Now we're not gonna talk about every one of these properties or different elements of this shader. By the way, when you add a material onto an object, it basically is called a shader. There are different shader types you can add. The principled BSDF shader is the default because it has so many different options. It's very versatile. Most of the time you stick to this, but in this video, we're gonna look how to mix different shaders together to make more complex materials a little later on. Let's go ahead first and just change the color to green. And so if I change this base color, this is actually a color picker here. If I click on it, you can see I got a color picker and I'll select green and I'll move my mouse and you can see the cube is green, <laughs> except you can't see it because of Blender's viewport shading modes, which are up here. You have wireframe, you have solid, which is the default. Solid does not display the material at all. The third and fourth options are what you want to go between. The third option, which is called Material Preview Viewport Shading, will actually do what it says. It'll show you the materials in a preview kind of a mode, which means that the lighting is not really your scenes lighting. It's more even. So you can see what your material looks like without all the shadows and things getting in the way. Now, this green material is actually a little bit shiny. It's a little bit reflective. You can't really see that right now. But what I'll do is I'll go and change this roughness slider which goes between zero and one well I want to turn the roughness up to make the material less shiny if you have the roughness all the way turned down the material will be reflective we'll talk about that in a sec but roughness up and now we have a flat or matte material that's green on the cube if I select a different mesh like the cylinder and I want to add a material to that well of course I can press new material or I can select a material that's already in my scene to reuse it that's this button right here you can see I can re-add material.001 but be careful if you change this material on a different object by default you are referencing the same material in your scene and so it'll change every time that material is used. I'll go ahead and press Control Z to undo that. If I wanna make a duplicate of this material.001, I can press this little duplicate button. By the way, this two here means that there are two objects or users of this material. You can also press this two to make a copy as well, or this little duplicate button. Now that I have a copy, I can recolor and change the properties of this material, and you can see I've got two different materials. By the way, you should get in the habit of naming your materials. If I select my green cube, it's called, or this green material is called material.001. I can name it right here. I will call it matte or flat green and press enter. There we go. I don't want to have this yellow matte flat material on it. So I will press this little minus button. By the way, this area right here actually contains or can contain slots with different materials in this area and that means you can have multiple different materials on the same object we'll get into that in a future video you can actually assign different materials to different faces in a mesh object of course we'll get to that in a future video for now i'll press this minus button to get rid of that material and actually it's slot so that's that minus button and i'll press new i'm going to make this material have a base color of red and i'll turn roughness all the way down so now you can see, well, actually, our cylinder is very reflective. It's shiny and it's reflecting things in our scene. But because I'm in this third material preview of viewport shading mode, it's not actually reflecting things that are necessarily in our real scene. It's actually reflecting, well, if you zoom in and orbit around, you might tell that it's reflecting trees. Why are there trees? And if I look here, there's actually a little fence. Why is it reflecting trees and a fence? Well, this material preview viewport shading mode has an HDRI, which is an environment texture. It's actually a photograph that's wrapped around the entire sphere of my world that's projecting light uh, onto the scene and reflective or uh, not rough objects will reflect that environment. But again, this is not really in our scene for the final render because we're only in material preview 
a viewport shading mode. If I go to the rendered view, which actually shows me my lights and shadows, you can see that's not there, okay? But it will reflect in this rendered view our actual scene to some extent. So just be aware, this HDRI, by the way, you can change in material preview mode if you go to this little arrow and this HDRI is what this one is. It's the uh, trees with a ground and some fencing. I think it's a path. You can change that right here. You can click on it and you can change it to a different one of the eight that are built in. So now my lighting will look a little bit different and the reflections will look a little bit different. Okay. Speaking of reflections, if I go into uh, render viewport shading mode, you can see that not a lot of reflections are happening right now. That's because, yes, Eevee is very fast. It's rendering all the shadows and the lighting in the scene, uh, you know, in real time, in, in right here in my viewport. But there are things that are turned off by default. If I go up to this first, or actually it's, it's the second tab, it's called the, if I hover over, it's called the Render Properties tab. This is where I can change the settings of my render engine, and I can actually change the render engine right here from Eevee to Cycles or Workbench. We want to turn on screen space reflections, turn this checkbox on, and you can see when I do that, now my in rendered view, the cylinder looks reflective. If I turn that off, you can see things go away, like the lighting that's bouncing up from the floor onto the underside of these objects. You can see things get a little bit nicer looking and a little bit more realistic this way. Please know that if I look from this angle, I can see this face of the cube being reflected in the red cylinder because it's glossy, it's not rough. But if I zoom in a little bit more, you will see that unlike in the real world, the reflection goes away when I get too close. And that's actually because of what's called the screen space, part of this reflections ability of our scene. It is only reflecting things in objects that you can see in the world. So if I orbit around here, so I cannot see that side of that green cube anymore, even though from this angle or one of these angles, you would be able to see that side of the green face. We can't see it in our viewport. It's not part of our screen space, so it's not being reflected. That's one of the limitations of EV and how EV calculates things so quickly. You can fix that and we'll get into that in a future video, but just know there are some limitations. So be aware of that. Next up is our metal ball or sphere. If I select it, first thing, I don't want it to look all rough and faceted. So what I can do with it selected is I can right click on it and select either shade flat or shade smooth. Shade flat is the default. You can actually see the individual uh, faces or polygons. If I right click and select shade smooth, it'll blend all of those different shades of the faces together in kind of a gradient. You'll notice that looking at the side of this sphere, it is still not very high polygon or, or high number of faces. It's not very dense. It's just doing this sort of shading technique sort of artificially. We'll actually do it a better way for our monkey head for the glass a little bit later in this video. So with my sphere selected, I'm gonna to go to the material tab, the beach ball right here. I'll press new to make a metal ball. I'm gonna turn up this metallic property. Now, technically metallic objects are either metallic or they're not. So this metallic slider really should be zero or one. You can decide if you want to stick to that, that law of physics and materials. I'm going to turn it up to one so you can see. And now we have a fairly metal looking object. Metal can be brushed and you can add different bumpiness materials to it. Uh, we're not going to get into that in this video. What you can do is you can change the roughness. So if you turn roughness all the way down, you'll get basically a perfect mirror like uh, sphere. If you turn roughness up, it looks a little bit more like metal. You will notice, of course, in the reflections of this metal sphere that you have that limitation where it'll only reflect things you can see in the scene. So I'm getting that red cylinder, but it's not rendering the face, the circular end of the cylinder, unless it's actually in my viewport like that. So be aware of that limitation. Next up is the glowing donut. We've been looking forward to this one, haven't we? If I select it, of course, I want to right click. I want to say, of course, shade smooth. I'll go over to my materials tab in the properties editor. I'll press new. I'm going to turn on what is called emission. First off though, I'm going to change the base color 
to yellow. There we go. And if I turn the emission color from black, which means basically, well, emitting light is where this word comes from. If I change this to a different color, I'll turn it up from black to white and I'll turn it to yellow. You can see now that my donut looks like it's brighter. It's glowing a little bit. It's not actually casting light onto other objects and we can change the emission strength. So if I turn this up to, I'll just click in there and I'll type, oh, 20. Well, now you can see on reflective objects or objects that have some glossiness, you will see a little bit of brightness being projected into the rest of the scene. Now, realistically, a glowing object like this would actually have a little bit of a haze around it. To enable that, we're going to go back into Eevee's render settings right here onto the second tab, and we're going to enable what is called Bloom. As soon as I check that, you'll see the effect. There's Bloom, there's Bloom off, there's Bloom on. Bloom, of course, has settings, and I wouldn't leave these at the default. I would turn up the threshold to make the Bloom not quite go as far, or at least not for objects that aren't bright enough to really have that kind of a bloom. I'll also turn down the radius a little bit and I can tweak the intensity a little bit as well. I might turn the threshold of down a little bit to make things that are less bright uh, glow. And I can adjust, of course, under the material tab, the emission strength to a different number. I'll try 35 or something like that. And I'll go back and tweak the intensity and the settings until I get the result that I'm looking for. All right, zooming out, if I deselect that uh, donut, you can see what it looks like. I've adjusted a few of the settings and I'm happy with that result. Last but not least, out of the five, I have my purple glass monkey head. If I select the monkey head and I zoom in a little bit, I'll right click after it's selected and say shade smooth. That'll make it look a little bit more smooth. But what I really want to do is add what's called the subdivision surface modifier to this monkey head. The subdivision surface modifier will actually take the faces and it'll subdivide the faces up. That's why it's called subdivision surface and it's a modifier. It'll modify the object to make it higher density and it'll smooth it out. And by density, I mean the number of faces. To do this quickly, I could just select it and press control and the number row two on my keyboard. Control two on my keyboard will make the monkey head have more faces, it'll be smoothed out. By pressing control two, what I actually did was I added it under this wrench tab, the subdivision surface modifier. And if I press this little X, I can get rid of it there's the original monkey head again. A modifier is basically a procedural change that you can make to an object, especially a mesh object. And there are lots of modifiers available. The subdivision surface modifier right here, if I just click on it after I select it, you can see it adds the modifier options right here and it makes the monkey head smooth. You can change the levels or the amount of subdivisions or smoothing up in the viewport and in your final render. I would not suggest that you turn these up beyond two unless you really want to test how fast and powerful your computer is without letting Blender crash. With the monkey head smooth, and by the way, you can turn off in your screen the effect of the modifier as long as you don't apply it. So I would never click on this apply until I'm very much done my whole scene. You can turn it off and on in your monitor or in the viewport, and you can turn this effect on and off in your final render as well. But let's go ahead and add glass. I'll select the monkey head. I'll go to my material properties tab. I'll press new. I'll pick a base color of purple magenta e color to make glass you need to turn up what is called in your principal bsdf shader the transmission of this material if i turn the transmission up that means it will transmit light and that basically means transmit light through it but ev does not have that set up or enabled by default i need to now go to my render properties so number one you add a normal base material uh, step two is you change the color. Step three, you turn up transmission. There's a few steps here, which is why I'm going over this. Transmission is all the way up. The next step is to go back to your render settings and under screen space reflections, if you open this section up, you need to enable refraction. Turn that on. And is it see-through yet? No, you need to do that though. I'll go back to my material properties after refraction is turned on. And I'm going to go down to the section called settings of this material. So if I scroll down onto the material settings, screen space refraction. And when I do that and I orbit around, 
Look what I get. I get some transparent glass. Now, it does not look that great right now, and that's because I need to adjust this refraction depth. And I might want to try uh, turning on back face culling. That might affect how things look. I can also play around with the blend mode of this object. We'll talk about that in a sec. But I will turn refraction depth up, and you can see how it changes the way that this object reflects a uh, light through it. If I turn this up to a value that I think the monkey head is thick in its most average way. You can see 2.9 meters. If I turn on my ground grid or if I go back to material preview, you can see each one of these ground grid squares is a meter. So if I think the monkey head is about, you know, three meters across, if I go back to rendered view, I should get a more accurate result. And there it is. Now, transmission of light looks a little bit speckly. Like it's not very smooth, it's kind of noisy. If you turn up onto the render tab, your viewport sampling to a higher number, 16 is quite low. I'll go ahead and click and type 256 in there and you can see it looks smoother now. For a render, I would recommend at least 512, if not 1,000 or 2,000 or even several thousand. Uh, that'll make everything in your scene look smoother, including the, the shadows in your scene. But this glass is starting to look fairly good. What I might wanna do is go back to the material settings and adjust the roughness of the glass to make it less rough. And I might wanna play a little bit more with that uh, refraction depth value to get a result that I like the look of. And you will see as we get later into this video and we add a texture to the floor and environment that you'll see that warped in a kind of a nice glassy way through the monkey head. Uh, but really quick, I want to duplicate this monkey head. So I'll press shift D on my keyboard, shift D for duplicate. And then I'll tap X to move it over to the side. If I don't want glass, but I want a transparent material, what I can do is I can turn down transmission but before i do that i better duplicate this material i'll press the duplicate button so i'm only editing it on uh, this second monkey head i'll turn down transmission i don't need that if i want to just make this monkey head look like a ghost that i can just see through uh, kind of evenly well i can turn down the alpha value of this material when i do that the alpha channel should make it transparent but in order for this alpha material to work like that, you need to change the blend mode in the settings of this material to one of the other options. I like alpha blend. When I do that, you can see the monkey head is now transparent. It doesn't look like glass and I might wanna turn off or play with this back face culling option uh, right there. And I might wanna change the show back face option right there. So if I turn on back face culling, that doesn't seem to matter when show back face is turned off. And if I change the alpha property now, you can see I'm affecting the transparency. So you have a little bit of a ghost in one case and more realistic glass in this case. Okay, I'll go ahead though and delete this uh, ghosty looking monkey head. There we go. So we're now finished our five objects. It's time to dive a little bit deeper here and talk about textures as well as nodes in Blender. In Blender, of course, at the top, you have different workspace tabs at the top, which change your arrangement of editors or sections of your screen, windows or panels, if you like, in Blender. There is one called Shading, which gives you access to this editor. It's called the Shader Editor. And the Shader Editor is used to add what are called nodes to make more complex, uh, very much more complex materials by mixing together different shaders, adding in image textures, adjusting colors, lots of things you can do in this editor. It looks very plain right now, but what I'm actually gonna do is go back to my first workspace tab, the layout tab, and I'm gonna split this 3D editor in two so I can have my own arrangement. To do that, I'll put my mouse cursor up in the top right corner, right in that little rounded top corner of this uh, section of the screen, and my mouse cursor changes to a little plus. Hopefully you can see that right there. If I drag, if I click and drag that to the left, I can split this editor into two. And now that I have a second new editor here, I can change this editor's type using this top on the header, this top menu here. You can change any editor into any editor type that you want. In this case, I'm gonna change my new 3D viewport editor into a shader editor right here in the first column. So there we go. It has a side panel. I can go ahead and drag the edge of that to collapse that. 
it's pretty empty looking. If I select one of my objects though, you will see nodes. If I go ahead and scroll up on my mouse wheel, you can see I can zoom in. If I hold my mouse wheel down like a button, like I'm orbiting in my 3D viewport, if I do that over here, I can pan my view around so I can center and zoom in by scrolling, of course, to see these. When I first started to learn nodes in Blender 2.6 for the Cycles Render Engine, I was very intimidated. I really shouldn't have been. These are not too hard to understand. A material can be broken down into different parts, but all materials on all mesh objects pretty much have to end or finish at the right of the node setup that you have here with what's called a material output node. Anything that you plug into using these ports and these lines, which are actually called noodles, makes up your whole material. Your principal BSDF shader over here is actually represented over here in its own node. And you can add with shift A on your keyboard or up in the add menu, different types of shaders and nodes. And you can attach them together using these ports and these noodles to create more complex materials. If I change the base color over here in this principal BSDF shader node to a different shade of green, you can see that the shade of green also changed over here. So everything here is over here as well. And of course, my actual cube changed to that color or shade of green. If I wanna to mix together two different types of materials to make one blended material, well, I can do that pretty easily in this shader editor using nodes. I'll go ahead and select this principal BSDF shader just by clicking on it. And of course I can drag them around using my left mouse button. Uh, with this node selected, I will press Shift D on my keyboard. Can I right click as well? Yes, right click and duplicate will do it as well. And I'll put this other copy right there. I'll change the color of this shader, which is not hooked up, so it will not affect the material yet. I'll change it to, oh, let's say red. And I'm gonna mix these two together using what's called a, it's a different shader. It's called under the add menu, under shader, it's called a mix shader. When I add a mix shader node into my shader editor, you can see it's right here. If I just click to place it, I can drag these ports to create new noodles and I'll plug, you can see I'm going from green port to green port and from green port to green port there. I'm gonna mix together the green and the red shaders and I have to connect this one, it's the output port to the material output. It has an input port right there. And you can see now, if I mix together this greeny yellow color with red, I get well, this browny orange color. If I mix together, oh, let's say blue and red, of course, I get a purpley magenta color. If I change the factor of the mix shader, well, I can affect how much of one color or the other I'm mixing together. And of course I can change any of the properties. So I could have a glossy blue material and a matte or flat looking red material, and I could blend them together as I choose. So I'm gonna use these nodes to make a more complex material than even this onto the floor in my scene. First off, I'm gonna go ahead and delete the mix shader because I'm gonna bring this material back to a, a matte green color to match the name that I gave it. And I can go ahead and reconnect things and delete nodes. And I'll change this back to green like I had before. I'll select my floor and you can see there are no nodes present because I don't have a material. I can press this button over here or I can press the same new material button up here to make the same new material. I'm gonna go ahead and make the color of my floor. I'm gonna make it, oh, let's say blue. And I'll duplicate this principal BFDF shader. I'll select it and shift D on my keyboard to duplicate it. And it also grabs it, of course. I'm gonna make the blue, um, I'm gonna make it totally rough. So it's not gonna be reflective at all. And I'm gonna make the other principal BFDF shader a red. And I'm gonna make it very much glossy and reflective. I'm going to go ahead and mix those two principal BSDF shaders together using, of course, under the add menu, under shader, a mix shader right there. And of course, just like before, I'm going to plug things together to configure the overall material the way that I want. This time though, you know, I've mixed together red and blue. So I have, of course, purple. This time though, I'm going to use the input in this mix shaders factor to bring in a procedural texture. Now in Blender, you can bring in, of course, an image texture, and we'll do that in just a few moments. But under add and texture, we have nodes that will actually create using an algorithm or different algorithms for each one, a texture that is just generated by the computer. 
one that's easy to understand is the brick texture. Bricks in the pattern that they are, are fairly easy to understand. You know, alternating set of rectangles with a spacing between them where the grout would be in bricks. And that's something that a computer can fairly easy figure out and replicate again and again using an algorithm or basically math and a little bit of programming. If I take this brick texture, which will just generate bricks on the fly, and I drag from its output factor port into the factor of the mix shader here, blending together my blue and my red materials, I get bricks. And you can see here, this brick texture's factor is influencing using the mix shader's factor, how the red and the blue materials are being used to create. So if I change the scale of my brick texture, you can see I can make the bricks bigger or smaller. I can probably change the mortar size as well. If I hold shift and drag in one of these value boxes, that'll make it move slower rather than just dragging, which can move quite quickly. And I can control that and I can probably change, you know, the brick width if I want. And you can play with that on your own. If I go ahead and switch the red and blue around in the mix shaders to ports, if I drag one noodle to the other, they'll switch spots. You can see that now I have a rather glossy looking set of bricks, but the grout or spacing between the bricks isn't reflective while the red material is reflective. So there is a fairly simple to replicate brick texture. I'll go ahead and zoom out on my node so you can pause the video if you want to recreate this. Uh, and there's how it looks in my scene. I'll turn off the overlays and the gizmos in my scene with those two buttons so you can see what it looks like. But actually, I'm going to put an image texture onto this flat plane. So I'm going to reconfigure and kind of simplify these nodes. I'll get rid of the bottom principled BSDF. I'll get rid of this mix shader and the brick texture, and I'll reconnect my principled shader to the output of the surface of my overall material there. What I'm going to do is actually bring in an image texture from my computer uh, using what's called under the add menu. It's a texture node. It's called the image texture uh, node. And if I click, I can add it and I can put it right here. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to use an image texture in place of the base color of my object. So I'm going to plug in the color of the image texture into the base color of my shader. And I haven't picked an image on my computer yet. So the material is black for now, but I can just press open and it'll bring me to an open dialog box where I can go on my computer and find an image file. Speaking of which, if I go into a web browser and I open up cc0textures.com, this is a great resource for you to know. It's a website. If I click up here on assets or categories, of texture packs to make very realistic what are called physically based rendering uh, texture packs for different types of materials. These materials actually come in multiple parts, many different image textures that you blend together into the same material using different image textures to create bumpiness called a bump map or a normal map, uh, roughness maps to define where on each texture the texture or material is glossy whereas part of the material might be very matte or not glossy, like bricks and the mortar and the surface of the actual bricks. I'm gonna go ahead and up in categories on cc0textures.com. If I go to the wood floor category, the first wood floor, I'm gonna go ahead and use this. It is called wood floor 041. I'll actually put a link to this in the description area below to you to find this exact page where I'll download the 2K which is a lower to medium resolution size uh, set of image files to make this texture up. Of course, you can download very, very large, high quality photos if you're doing something for a professional purpose. In my case, on my desktop, I'll go ahead in Blender, I've pressed open on that image texture uh, node. On my desktop, I have that folder unzipped from cc0textures.com. It's right here. If I go into that folder, I'll actually view as thumbnails here. You can see I've got my wood texture image. It's a square like all of the other images here, but this image defines the color of my wood texture for the floor. This purple picture here is called a normal map, which defines the bumpiness of the material. There are different textures that you can combine together into the same material for different purposes like where shading and shadows are where the material is rough or glossy. In this case, I'm just going to use the color for this video here. So I'll select that picture and press open image. And now you can see 
I have a wood floor. It's not super realistic here because there's no bumpiness. There's no different areas that are more shiny and dull. It's very flat looking, especially if I turn the roughness uh, down, you can see that, you know, it looks like a very smooth varnished floor. And of course, if you try to do this technique onto a 3D object where you were trying to put this wood around the different surfaces of, let's say, a monkey head or even a table, you would need to do what's called UV mapping to uh, assign different parts of the same uh, texture onto the correct parts of your 3D model. Again, we'll get to that in a future video. In my case, I'm actually not going to use this wood floor. I wanted to show it to you, but I'm going to press this X to clear that image texture out of this node. In this case, I'm going to actually have Blender create an image for me. I can actually make new image files and save them as PNG picture files or JPEG picture files on my computer. If I press this new button, it'll bring up a little pop-up and I can make a new picture with a resolution of my choice. But in my case, I'm not going to make a new blank uh, picture with a black color filling up this square resolution of, of the picture file. In my case, I'm going to choose what's called a UV grid, which looks a lot like a checkerboard, but with numbers and colors in each tile of the checkerboard, essentially. So if I select UV grid, I'll name this picture UV grid, and I'll press enter, and I'll press OK. You'll see I get a UV grid uh, on my plane. If I actually want to see that picture file in kind of an image viewer in Blender, I can go up to uh, my texture paint, a workspace tab here in this left side of the screen is that image file that I've just created. If I want to save this picture file, well, I can go under this texture paint workspace to the image menu here and I can say save or save as, and I can actually save it as a PNG or a JPEG file on my computer. But instead what I'm going to do just under my layout tab is I'm going to go up to file and go down to external data. And I'm going to say pack all into blend. This will take that picture file that really should be a separate picture file but it'll actually make it a part of my Blender file. So file, external data, and pack all into Blend. And you can see down here, it says to me, packed one files. It's basically put that picture file and integrated it into this Blender file. So if I wanna send somebody else this Blender file project, I don't have to send them a separate picture file along with my .blend Blender file. It's all just in one file. So it's a good practice whenever you bring image textures into Blender to go up to file, external data and pack all into blend. Lastly is our environment. Right now, I just have my default gray world that's actually casting gray light onto my scene. It's actually lighting my scene a little bit. This video really isn't meant to talk about lighting too much, but because I will be adding a texture or material to my environment, it belongs, I think, in this video. If I wanna change this default gray color, I can go over to my properties editor and I can go to the world tab. And here I can change the color of my background of my scene. So if I change my scene, let's say have a blue sky, I'll turn the brightness up. There you go, now my scene's brighter with a lighter gray sky. I can also change it to a blue sky, but when I have a blue sky, it projects blue light into my scene. I might not want that. This is a case where I might want to actually use Nodes or the Shader Editor to make a custom material for my world. Now, this Shader Editor right now is set to Object Mode. That means we're looking at Nodes for materials on objects. But if I change this menu here to World Mode, well, now I'm seeing the Nodes of my world. And you can see a world material has a world output this time, as well as a special shader called a background shader. Of course, I can change the color here. I can make it, you know, a lighter shade of blue. I can choose whatever I want. I can change the strength of the world, how much light it's projecting onto my scene. I'll leave it at one. One neat thing you can do using nodes for your world material is actually blend together two different colors and you can have one material be how your sky looks and the other material will act as the lighting for your scene. So you can have a blue sky but not have it project blue, very intense blue light onto your scene. To do that, I'm going to go ahead and select my background simple color node. I'll press shift D on my keyboard to duplicate it and I'll put the copy right down here. I'm going to use that same under the add menu. It's called the mix shader. So add shader mix shader. I can blend together two different worlds uh, just by mixing, mixing them together 
here just like that. I'll change one of them to a much less intense blue. And you can see I can change the factor of how they mix together. But what I want to do is separate uh, this background material to be how the sky looks and this one to be the color projection onto my world. To do that, it sounds pretty complicated, but it's actually pretty easy. I'm going to bring in another node that has a lot of power to it. And to be honest, I'm not really sure how to use a lot of its features, but under the add menu, under input, I'm going to add what's called a light path node. So add input light path. And it looks like this, and there's lots of output ports on it. All I have to do here is connect the is camera ray uh, output port here to the factor of my mix shader and you can see it's actually doing the opposite of what I want it's actually projecting blue light making everything blue onto the scene but it's making my sky look the bottom color so I'll just switch around these colors here these background shaders and there we go I might want to adjust the color of my scene lighting I'm making it a little bit more blue but that could be handy for any of you who are looking to make a cartoon in the future with a blue sky, but not entirely blue lighting on your scene. Something else we can do is put an image texture onto our world so we can actually see it, or we can have an image texture that just projects light from a whole spherical uh, image texture onto our scene, but we can choose the background color for our sky and not see that image if we don't want to. And we can adjust them together and we can make whatever node setup that we want. But I'm going to go ahead and bring in, I'm going to add a texture. This time it's not going to be an image texture. It's going to be an environment texture, even though I'm bringing an image in from my computer, we're still going to use environment texture here. So I'll click there and place that right there. In our case, now we need one of those HDRI uh, image textures that will act as our entire environment. These are special picture files. HDRI stands for High Dynamic Range Imaging. And when you're talking about an HDRI image for a world, it needs to be basically an unwrapped sphere, an image that can actually fold together to make a sphere and there is a great resource I want to show you for that. It's called hdrihaven.com. That's on the screen right now. This is a website with free HDRI images. If I go to this website and then go up to HDRIs, you will see what an HDRI looks like. It basically is a whole globe or a sphere unwrapped into a large panoramic a rectangular picture and if I scroll down you can see kind of what it looks like if I go over to the left side where there are categories under sunrise sunset I'm gonna go to now view I really like this third HDRI it's called Cape Hill so I'll put a link to this page uh, in the description area below what you'll need to do is choose a quality of image texture to download here. These are not JPEG or PNG image files. These are special, much larger in file size uh, image files that have more colors and a higher bit depth, in other words, of tones in the image file to better project light into your scene. So be aware of the file size that you're downloading. In my case, I think I just chose 2K and I have that file on my desktop. So I'm gonna go down to my environment texture node. I'll press open. On my desktop, I will view as thumbnails here. You can see that Cape Hill HDRI uh, 2K picture there. I'll press open with it selected. And now I'm going to connect it to both the background of my scene. So now the light from that HDRI is projecting onto my scene, even though we can't see it because I still have the blue world here. If I want to see it and have it project light onto my scene, I could actually have a simpler node set up here than what I currently have. I don't need to have this light path really, but in my case, I will adjust how the picture looks in my scene and how much light it's projecting separately. So I'll leave this set up the way that I have it, but I will connect the color uh, from the picture to the light on my scene and the way it looks. Uh, separately here. So as you can see now, I have got my HDRI picture and I can orbit around if I'm in rendered viewport shading mode and I can see how it looks. It's pretty spectacular. If I want to adjust the strength or how bright it looks, well, I can adjust the strength of either one of these two background uh, shaders. This top one in my case will affect how bright the HDRI is actually projecting onto the world and I can hold shift and drag in that little value box to adjust it more precisely. And I can adjust how bright it actually looks 
in, in my world and how it will look when it actually renders out. Of course, if I don't want to have the actual photograph in the background, I could just disconnect that, but in my case, I will leave it. Now, an image texture or even an environment texture like an HDRI can be placed in different ways onto an object. In this case, I might want to change where this image environment texture is in my world. If I want to look at my five objects here all lined up, but I want to have that nice sunset kind of in behind the objects, well, I can rotate this HDRI image texture in my world. To do that, I'm going to change the vector of my image environment texture here by plugging in a few different nodes. What I'll do is I'm going to go up to the add menu and I'm going to input what's called a texture coordinate a node. So input texture coordinate. When I add this node to my scene, basically it gives me a list to choose from of different ways you can map a texture onto a surface, including your world environment. In this case, I'm going to use what's called generated because we can manipulate this one quite easily. I'm going to drag from that port into the vector of my environment image texture. So nothing here should change because your environment texture actually uses the generated uh, mapping by default. But what I can do now that I have this texture coordinate uh, mapping node in here is I can affect how it's mapped by placing a modifier node right in the middle of this noodle. I'll go up to the add menu and I'm going to add a vector mapping node, vector mapping. And when I add that vector mapping node, you can see it has value boxes for the location, rotation, and scale in all three axes that I can change of a texture coordinate if I put this node right in the middle of that noodle. So I'll just drag it on top of that noodle and let go. It's plugged in correctly. So now what I can do is I can change, if I want to rotate the world around the Z axis, I can just drag that value up and you can see what's happening here. So I'm going to rotate my view or orbit my view. So I'm looking at my five objects. I'm going to rotate my environment on the Z axis and I can rotate it even on the X axis to tilt the whole world around. And if I adjust the shading or the brightness of my background, which one is it? It's not the top one. It's the bottom one. I can make my sky darker, make a very final sunset look to my scene. Maybe I'll cast some light through the monkey head. And we have basically our final scene here. So up on the screen right now, I've got my final render on the left and the node set up for my environment on the right. If you would like to pause the video to get this node set up for yourself, if you're new to nodes, I know it can be a little bit intimidating to mix together this number of nodes, but you can pause the video and try replicating this for yourself. But that will be it for this video. Thanks for watching as always. My name is Colin. If you like this video or if you're doing something in it, please go ahead and click on that like button below. It really helps out me and my channel and gets these videos seen. If you want to see more videos like this one in Blender or in the Godot game engine, click on that subscribe button as well and click that bell icon to be notified whenever I upload a new tutorial. Check out my Facebook page and my Instagram pages. In those two places, I post sneak peeks and previews of what I'm working on next. And it's where I communicate with you, my viewers, the most outside of here on YouTube. But that'll be it for this one. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.